We're combining the shapes and forms of plants to create garden rooms, and it's all coming up right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. You can't believe the aroma of these roses. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. It's a show about design and design principles. Now, in today's show, we're going to focus on not only the shapes and forms of gardens and garden spaces, but we're also going to take a look at all the different kinds of shapes one can find in the way of plants. Let me give you an example. Look at this columnar arborvita. You can see that they make a ring around this circular garden, but they're also working in concert with Sarah Van Fleet, a shrub rose. So you get this big mound of gorgeous blooms this time of year, juxtapose these tall, elegant forms. So it's combining the forms of nature, the forms of plants that can really give you a special effect in gardens. Now we're gonna make several trips on this show. We're gonna visit a governor's mansion and talk about how bare root roses, along with some tips on maintaining and clearing your land can make such a difference. And also we're gonna take a trip to Louisville, Kentucky, well, John, meet with the director of horticulture at Churchill Downs, and he gives us a tour of their amazing gardens. Okay, let's get started. Let's take a look in the house for a construction update and see how the mudrooms come along. Let's go. Well, welcome to the mudroom. It has certainly transformed. If you remember several months ago, it was really a disaster. Well, it wasn't a disaster. They were just working at it very methodically. And it's a great place for me to bring flowers in from the garden. And what I particularly love is this really deep sink. Mm, these iris are incredible. I wish you could smell them. And you can set them down in here. And I like it because it's cool and dark in here, which will help keep the flowers lasting uh, much longer. Now, this sink I'm very proud of. This is a farm sink that a friend of mine who's a specialist in stone actually installed, and it's made of soapstone. But if you've ever used soapstone, you know that it has to be cared for a certain way. Terry Geta and his wife, Kathy, not only designed and built the sink and installed it, but Terry also helped me understand what I need to do to take care of it. Each job um, that we do, we look at it as an individual. Marble, granite, and limestones really stand the test of time because of the quality of the material. You can hone the material, which will take the high shine off, the high polish, give it more of a satin finish. One of the unique things of soapstone is its ability to last and its ability to be freshened up every time you want it to look like a new surface. One of the reasons we use mineral oil for soapstone is because it gives it a whole new look every 30 days if that's something you want to do. And it can make such a dramatic difference on the beauty of the stone. It's not going to make it look shiny as it will bring out the color of the stone. So you can see the dramatic difference between using oil and not using oil. I don't know about you, but I love homegrown tomatoes and I try to get them out as early as I can. I know it's still a little cool, but I'm going ahead and setting some out. This one is a little sweet 100 and I just love it. Now it's indeterminate and that means that it has an indeterminate length. It will grow, so I'm going to have to stake it. A determinate tomato will grow to a certain size and stop. Now, I want to give you a couple other tips on how to grow some really great tomatoes. What I like to do is pinch off these bottom leaves just like this, all right? See that? And then I'm going to bury 80% of this plant after I tear into the roots. You see how I'm doing that? 
tearing into the roots and if that little peat pot falls apart, you just drop it in the hole. There's no problem there. You just want to tear the roots, get it down in the ground. Now I'm going to put it in there and bring that soil up around it like this. You see? Now, if you want to keep cutworms from coming along, and it's heartbreaking when you go out in your garden and your tomato is cut off, take a little piece of aluminum foil like this and just wrap it around the bottom just like that. Just takes a minute and just wrap it around there. And as that tomato grows, you can take that away because the stem of that tomato will get so tough that that cutworm cannot cut it off and you're home free from the cutworms. You know, I love this idea of blurring the lines between inside and out, and I'm always looking for ways to do it. Now, this is my painting studio, and as you can see, we've created an arbor, or really it's a pergola, that runs along the length of the studio. Now, the idea is to create almost another room out here by simply placing these four big square posts with a slight chamfer. You can see the slight chamfer on the edge, and then with just a simple cap at the top, and then these unpainted support timbers for a vine. Now, here's where we get to this thing. I found four of these in a nursery. They were in the back and nobody wanted them. This is Wisteria frutescens. It is the American Wisteria. Now, we're all familiar with Wisteria sinensis, or the Chinese Wisteria, with those gorgeous purple blooms that you see climbing up in trees and everywhere. And then the Japanese Wisteria, with its beautiful long racemes, is yet another one. Well, this is an American variety, and it has beautiful, almost slight violet colored blooms. And I think that's where they got the name of this particular cultivar called Amethyst Falls. Now what I'm going to do is just take all of this dead away, but you can see, look at all of this new growth coming up. And what I plan to do is plant one of these on the corner here and one on the corner there. And I'm going to train them up the columns and let them cover the top of this arbor completely which will add more to the shade here. And then you'll see those beautiful blooms. And what's interesting about this particular variety of wisteria, it doesn't bloom as heavily, but will, it will often repeat itself through the season, throwing off these little almost grape-like clusters. So what we're doing here is we're blurring the lines between inside and out with both structure and with, of course, plants. When planting bare root roses, there are a few simple tips that you should follow to have happy and healthy plants. We're working at the governor's mansion where I'm planting several bare root roses. For some reason, people are afraid to plant roses and particularly afraid to plant bare root roses. I just want to show you how easy it is. Now, I know this looks like a space alien, but this is actually a bare root rose. And you can see that this is the bud union. This is where the, this particular type of rose was grafted onto uh, some rootstock. Now, the reason you need to know that is that's the level you're going to plant it, okay? So that gives you an idea how deep the hole needs to be. The other thing you want to do is dig a hole wide enough or round enough that the roots can gently rest in there just like this, okay? Now, I dug this hole twice as deep as I need to, and I filled it with 50-50, the soil I took out of the hole, with a really good source of humus. Uh, this is a potting mix that has mycorrhizae in it, which is a, a fungus, a beneficial fungus that helps the roots really get started, those little baby feeder roots. So what I've done here, you can see I want to make sure that that bud union is right up here and not buried. All I have to do now is add a little water. There we go. So the soil will settle. And then I'm just simply going to take this soil and put back around the rose like this. Okay, see, see how I mixed it? This is basically clay soil and the humus really, really breaks it up. You see what you want is you want to mix it 
into the clay such that when you squeeze the soil like this, okay, you squeeze it as hard as you can, when you open your hand it all falls apart. That's when you know you've got it right, okay? So I'm going to pull it all around here like this. I'm going to make a little slight, little slight well around it. And then I'm going to take some organic fertilizer. About a half a cup. I'm going to sprinkle the organic fertilizer around it like this. And that's a 5-5-5 ratio. And then I'm going to water it in slowly so it all seeps in around the rows. And then I'll, I'll wait for this to to trickle down around the roots and then I'll just add a little more soil around it like this and build back my well and make sure that it's all settling in nicely and then the next step would be to mulch it and you won't believe it but these sticks within three months will be full of flowers. On a recent trip to Louisville, Kentucky, I was invited to visit the gardens of Churchill Downs. I have to say, there was a lot more there to see than I expected. The gardens were really amazing and full of eye-popping color. I met with the horticultural director, John Backert, and he gave us a guided tour of the grounds. John, it's such a pleasure to come out here and see these gorgeous animals when there's not a major race going on. I've been here before when the race is going on, but now you can really focus on these animals. Oh, absolutely, and they're, they're such beautiful athletes. You know, it's a great setting to be here, like you said, in the morning, see the workouts and yeah. uh, see what's going on. Yeah, well, one of the things I enjoy, of course, uh, are the, the, the plantings, and you as director of horticulture uh, are sort of the, the, the maestro that pulls the color together for a very long season of, of races. Yeah, our fall season begins at the end of October and then runs through the weekend after Thanksgiving. So, you know, we're post-frost, we have a lot of uh, a lot of things to deal with as far as that, and we use, rely a lot on texture and color, but we get some things that are blooming too. So. Well, I saw some gorgeous things driving in. I'd love to go on a tour. Absolutely, let's go. Well, Alan, if you're going to start a tour, this is probably the place to do it. This is uh, the Aristides Garden. It's the oldest section of Churchill Downs. Now, Aristides was the first winner of the Kentucky Derby. Absolutely, it's the first winner, 1875. This is so gorgeous here, the way you have Aristides surrounded by these magnificent roses. Horticulture plays such a strong role here, doesn't it? It does, and all the way back to the beginning, you'll see great floral displays, great, absolutely tremendous annual plantings, and I think a lot of that had to do with building an atmosphere. Just give me an idea of sort of what you're up against, oh. length of season, the number of people per year, the acreage. Well, I do 250,000 people for Derby Week alone. About a million people a year come through Churchill Downs, about 140 acres. You know, and even for late October, I mean, it's just outstanding looking. Well, thanks, Alan. Let's, uh, let's take a look and see some other areas. Great. Maybe you see a horse or two. You bet. I love it. So what is this, John? This is the paddock area. Um, this is where horses are actually come to be saddled before the races. They're trained in this area to uh, get used to the crowds. I see certainly some gorgeous peppers, which yeah. fit the fall, and then mumps, which are classics. But then, then I see some things there in the center that look like maybe they've bloomed throughout the entire <laughs> summer. They have, and that's osteospermum. And you know, I thought the thing was gonna burn out on me early in the spring, like most of those osteos do. So I yeah. interspersed it with some scavola, thinking the scavola would overtake it. It's been the other way around. Well, you're doing a great job here. It's just an inspiration to see it. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you. You know, and I enjoy what I do. This is, a, this is a terrific to have you guys come out. And uh, I hope you enjoyed your time in Kentucky. If you're into gardening, you're probably already into this idea of reusing things. Just like when we built the house here at the Garden Home Retreat, all of the soil, that beautiful topsoil, probably the first eight to 10 inches, I couldn't stand to throw away. So we stockpiled it and we used that soil for the terrace gardens just behind the house. And then when we got into the subsoil, well, we carried that away and used it to fill in some ravines. Now I've created this acre vegetable garden. And an acre, just to give you an idea, is 209 feet square. So 209 times 209, 
you get roughly this shape. Now this is slightly longer than it is deep and it's just a little under an acre. And what I decided to do was take this little piece of ground here that had been already cut back in the 1950s. So there really weren't very many big trees here at all. There was a lot of brush, a lot of saw briars and things like that. And we managed to save about a dozen pine trees that we're gonna cut for poles for the barn that we're gonna build. But anyway, the soil was so important to me to get right. It really needed to be uh, amended. We started out with a good base, but I wanted to bring in a lot of compost, any sort of decayed organic matter. So we started with compost and then piled on top of that sand. And with that, we took uh, litter or the sort of bedding that they use at the state fair for the livestock. We took all of that that had been stockpiled and blended this together. Oh yeah, I can't forget about the chicken litter. We put chicken litter out here and you know, you could tell it for several days. But then we pushed all of that into this garden and then integrated it into the existing soil. Then came putting lime. Now, what you want to do with a vegetable garden is you want a pH that is somewhere between six and seven. And what we had was a little bit on the acidic side, so we added lime. And you can see some of the lime here on top of the ground. It looks like a dusting of snow. And that'll sweeten this soil because it's naturally acidic clay, what we have here. Now what I'm doing is I'm literally laying out the rows the way I want this vegetable garden to work. And I've come up with a 12-foot path that runs down the center of the north and south axis. And then radiating on each side of that 12-foot path will be perennial vegetable varieties or brambles or things that are going to persist in the garden that you don't plant year after year. For instance, we'll have blackberries, we'll have raspberries, we'll have blueberries, and then along in here there'll be asparagus and strawberries. These are plants that stay in the garden. And then in between these ribs, if you will, there'll be plenty of space to grow the annual vegetables, tomatoes and squash and cucumbers and onions and all of those sorts of things, and particularly potatoes. We're actually getting some potatoes planted today and I'm very excited about that. However, when I think back when this process started, that was clearing the land, I tell you, it was quite a challenge. Recently, Dan Paschke came out to the Garden Home Retreat so we could discuss what we needed to do to prepare the property. Hey, Dan. Hey, Alan. Well, we're doing, making good progress out there. Well, good. Well, it looks like it may start raining. I was hoping to get this crab apple in as soon as I could, but it looks like they might have to wait till maybe tomorrow. Yeah, the clouds are coming in. Well, how'd it go? Well, we're making some progress. I think the first thing we did was we went through the field and we picked out the big rocks with this front end loader and kind of pushed them out of the way. Yeah, there's a lot of big rocks out there. Yeah, we found quite a few. So we got those out of the way first, then we came back with the rotary cutter, went through and chopped it down nice and low. We got all that brush out of there for you. Yeah. Last thing I think we have to do after we finish with the rotary cutter is go back and get the small rocks out. You didn't hit many rocks with it, I hope. Uh, we hit a few, but for the most part, we did all right. Yeah, good, good. Well, you know, I like getting the edges of these woods cleaned out because it helps on a lot of different levels. We, I like to run the sheep up in there in the summer because they've got a few trees to get under, so they get a little protection. Also, the poultry, we push, it, push the poultry houses up there. And last year, it was so close to that wood line, we had some predators come in and actually kill some of the birds. So cleaning that out, I think, is going to help. Yeah, I, I think you won't have that problem next year. We got in and got a lot of that brush out. There's a little more to go. Well, listen, I sure appreciate your help. No problem. Always happy to help. It's a big place. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the part of the show where I take photographs that you send to me. We take a look at them, play around with some ideas, do a little virtual makeover. Today we have an interesting house in South Carolina owned by Sharon. Now Sharon pointed out in her note to me that she really likes boxwoods and that caught my eye because I love boxwoods as well. It's a great structural plant. Now she also said she didn't like the color of brick on the house. One of the things that I did at the Garden Home Retreat is we actually did a lime wash with a pale butter yellow. So you might think about that. You know, it's a white house, you have white columns, Maybe you just need to go with the white. That's one opportunity uh, that I see here already. Now, I think that what you're gonna need to do, Sharon, is if you wanna do that lime wash, uh, give it a try, but just do it on a small part of the house first. 
And what I think needs to happen here is that we've got to have some connection from here to here. Also, this looks a little forlorn over here, so let's take a look at that. So why don't we get started? All right. What I'm thinking, since you love boxwood so much, that we may do a framework of boxwood here. But first, let's talk about some hardscape opportunities. I really think you need a path that sweeps around here, and this looks like a parking pad. Now you, I noticed you had some picket fence over on this side of the house. And what I would encourage you to do is maybe repeat that picket here and here, and then just have a post with a picket like this and a gate and have this brick path, or it could be flagstone, it could be anything you like, come up to this point. Now, then what I would do is take, in the way of planting, a boxwood hedge all along here and define this, okay? Now, I know you've got a gate coming out and around, and what you could do with that is just simply do a stepping stone path behind this boxwood hedge that would connect over here and create a bed that works like this all the way around and let those stepping stones come through the bed. Now across the back here, this is a huge opportunity across here, I see. And I would do dogwoods all across like this and then I would underplant it with azalea. So you'd have these beautiful white dogwoods here in the background and then you'd have evergreen azaleas, something like George Tabor or Gigi Gerbing, which is white. Again, let's go with this white theme. And then on the corner, what about a Chinese snowball right here? I just think that would be terrific. And then what you might do is just lose these little bits of liriope uh, or monkey grass. If, if you want to go with it, what I would recommend is fill the entire bed with monkey grass, just the entire bed with that variegated monkey grass. And you need to add a few more boxwoods up here as well. Um, and if you could bring some azaleas in there, that would be terrific, but you're gonna have a problem because you've got this big eastern red cedar and that's gonna take a lot of moisture. I noticed the water hose over here and I bet it's because that soil is so dry. Anyway, Sharon, I think you've got a great looking house and by adding some of this framework around it, I think it will really give it a whole new dimension. Good luck with your project. You know, when you really begin to think about it, you see shape and form everywhere. Look at this row of boxwoods and this boxwood here. Shape and form really plays an essential role in the design of a garden. And I just had to point out this big post oak. She's around 350 years old and we call her the big sister. She's a Quercus stellata. And here in early spring, she's leafing out. You know, the shape and form of this tree will become even more apparent as we get into summer and then of course into fall when the leaves color. But what's important is just the form, the shape of the tree, because that is what dictated the layout of this entire place, the placement of the house, the gardens in the back, and the center alley that takes you down through the orchard. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.